Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, excited about today, because today the year gets cranked up. Our Bible studies and our, our uh, Sunday school, and of course we've got that meeting tonight, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, uh, but really, really, really excited uh, about our, our year. You know, as Cody was talking earlier about muscle memory, you know, I've developed a muscle memory. It's true. It goes like this. I was hoping this time of the year, you know, with all this heat, has been hot, eh? Uh, that, that, you know, I just, I would just really feel like eating salads and blara and twigs and stuff like, it doesn't work like that. How many of you discovered that chocolate does not have a season? It's not just like, <laughs> just a, it doesn't matter with summer, winter, it doesn't have a season, you know? And uh, even though sometimes you get them from the shop and that thing is so melted, and you can't even pick it up with your hands, but you're happy to open the wrapper and pull out your tongue. It works just as, just as, as well. But uh, so, so uh, anyway, all of those of you like me have made a resolution to try and lose some weight. Hey, it's tough. It's tough. But, but we're going we're gonna to pull through. But one thing I haven't decided not to do, I, I'm not a vegetarian. Jesus said, be imitators of me. Uh, and, and I want to, Jesus was a meat eater, you know. You never find Jesus eating zucchini and, and broccoli on the beach. And that way it didn't happen. It's a good stuff. Anyway, hey, if you're visiting with us this morning, it's fantastic to have you. We really, we've got a number of visitors, and it's wonderful, wonderful to have you. Uh, Sharon, it's great to have you uh, v- visiting here with, with Adele. Ah, wow, what an awesome year it's going to be. Uh, just a couple of notes, folks. Um, th- we're starting a brand new teen class. Okay, Dan's going to be teaching it. And uh, so if you've got teenagers in the house, so is it from 13 upward to 12, uh, t- from 12 upwards, uh, we've got a class for you. And uh, Don loves that age group and done a great job over the years. So that will be uh, happening there. Uh, folks, uh, Carol has asked us to remember her grandson in our prayers. He went away on the holidays. He came back. He picked up a serious infection. He's lost a lot of weight. He's trying to overcome that. Your prayers are solicited. For Carol's grandson. And while I'm asking you to pray uh, for, for him, uh, please remember Jean. Uh, Jean's going for a cornea transplant. Heather, Heather, that has to do with the eyes, just in case you're not sure. Okay. So, uh, so th- it's, it's serious, folks. This is a transplant. And we really, really need to remember Jean in our prayers. And, and of course, Billy has uh, continued to struggle with the chemo. It's having major effects on his body. He's been hospitalized because of his vomiting with the chemo. And, and of course, uh, his mom, Lottie, they're not doing well. Folks, we've got a lot of people to keep in our prayers. So, folks, please remember tonight, we're going to be coming together and uh, we're going to be talking about Vision 2020. Doesn't the Bible say, without a vision, my people? They perish. And so we as God's people need to have a vision. It needs to be a vision that, that, that is, um, has God's wisdom in it. It has to be more than we can do in ourselves because we don't need God if we can do it ourselves. So we, 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 uh, we've been praying for some time and, and tonight we would just love to hear from you. So come and join us at 6 o'clock, bring a plate of eats, and we're going to spend an hour just together say, hey, wouldn't it be great if this? Wouldn't it be great if that? We, and, and so we, we just want to hear uh, what's on your heart, and so the, the leadership of this church then can co- collate all that and kind of come together. Now, we, it's very important that we, we understand what the vision should be, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the purpose of the church. For instance, um, you know, we could say, hey, let's... Save the whales. You know, saving the whales is a very good thing. Or what about climate change? You know, that, that would be a good thing. Or what about, hey, don't we need organization? Get involved in politics. Well, you know, that, that might be a good idea. Or, or clean up the beachfront. Those are all great ideas. But that is not the purpose of the church. You know, let me take you to a couple of scriptures, and then I'll, we, will, we will wrap it up. I'll just take you through to kind of guide our minds as we get into this idea of what the purpose of the church So. The, if we look in the Gospels, there's only three times the word church is used. Now, the Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we only find the word church three times, and it's all in the book of Matthew, and it's in chapter 16. And uh, the very first time is, is when Peter uh, and, and Jesus are having this discussion, and the other apostles are there. And um, then Jesus eventually asks, who do men say that I am? This is the question that Jesus put out, of the, out there. And, and the answers came back, hey, you, some, some say that you're John the Baptist. 
Others said Je- Jeremiah. Uh, Someone said Elisha. Some of you say, hey, p- perhaps he's one of the prophets. And then Peter puts up his hand as Peter was uh, kind of the, the, the go to guy on, uh, hey, if anybody wanted to say anything. And he said to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter came back to him and said, Blessed are you, son of Bar Jonah. Okay, Bar means son of. Okay, Bar Jonah, his father. And uh, he said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, nobody told you this. But my Father is in heaven. And then Jesus said, and let's, let's put it up there, Rory, upon this rock, upon the statement that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And, uh, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Folks, this is a staggering statement. And then, of course, that's exactly what Jesus did. And today, we are part of the Carpenter's Church. This is the only organization that has stood the test of time. We've had massive corporations with huge budgets and very intelligent men and women over the years. None of them has stood the test of time like has the church. So Jesus said, I will build my my church and the gates of Hades will not... um, will not over- overcome it. What a prophecy. Uh, the great, one of the greatest institutions, the greatest ch- institution ever, is the church that Jesus bought with his, bud, uh, 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 with his blood. A carpenter, followers who didn't have education, but they believed in a resurrected Savior, and so the message went out, and it went global. It went global. And then, of course, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 8, is that we read that Jesus is the head of the church and he is the head of the body, the church. So the church is not a building, okay? It's not an, um, it's not an edifice. The church is the people and Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. You know what? The Pope is not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church and he has supremacy in absolutely everything he was the visionary he was the architect he was the builder and now he is the sustainer of his church you know jesus said he said he doesn't say i am i i was he said i am he is the i am jesus is alive and and that's why we serve him that's why his church is still exists today so i want to take you a passage in ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 for me, one of the most staggering passages on the church. So let, Rory, let's go there. So have a look. His intent, you know what intent means? It's, it's come from where we get the word intention from. That this is what Jesus wanted to, uh, to do. So his intention was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. And then he goes on to say it's made known to rulers and and, and, uh, principalities and powers in higher places. A little bit of a complex verse later on. But folks, this is amazing. That up to now we had we had uh, we had prophets and and, uh, we had leaders like Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And um, you know, we had all these great people, but not anymore. Now God's wisdom is going to be made known through the church. That's incredible. God didn't choose, hey, listen, I'm going to send angels, or I'm going to, I'm going to put together a, a corporation or conglomeration of intelligent men with IQ above 150, and they will drive this thing. They will make my wisdom known. By the way, you know what the word manifold wisdom is? For those of you who enjoy working on car engines, you know your car has got a manifold. Okay, but like the exhaust manifold. It encompasses all things. The word manifold, by the way, the original means, means multicolored. And really meaning multifaceted. So that the church, you and I, is, is how God's wisdom is going to be made known, even to principalities and powers in heavenly places. This is amazing. Just ordinary people, you and I. He's not going to choose individuals like no, no more of the Moseses and the Abrams and the Isaacs and Jacob, no more tribes, but through the church blood bought on the cross the the manifold wisdom of god would be made known um I, folks i cannot even begin to understand that and what is god's manifold wisdom well all the facets of god 
through the church, through no other institution, no other person, not through the heavenly realms, but through the fallible church. And we know we're fallible. We know we're fallible. I mean, we looked in the Bible, we see all those fallible. The Corinthians were all messed up, um, which in the church in Galatia, in, in Ephesus, in the church in, in Colossae. We look at the seven churches of Asia. Oh, and John has to write, and, and most of them were messed up. But that's the way God chose, that His wisdom through the, be made known through the church. And that's why we need to talk about a vision. How are we going to do that? What are we going to do? What strategy, what budgets are we going to put to, to uh, the, those things? Now, I want to just, once again, galvanize in your mind the fact that the church is you and I, called out people, not always meeting like this. In fact, many of the early churches were house churches. In fact, the church, church in Rome was full of our churches. Uh, the church in Ephesus, in, in, in fact, uh, a lot of the research is suggesting that the elders in the church in Ephesus were the elders over the town because there were people in, in the different homes. Have a look at this passage of Scripture, and I, I just picked one. Uh, this is just of random. If, uh, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2. To Philemon and brother, friend, and fellow laborer, Okay, remember the story about Philemon? It's all about a runaway slave. Uh, and Paul has to write to him and talk to him about how to handle the slave who's become a Christian and now he's coming back. How do you handle that? To the beloved Athia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Many people had churches in their homes and every now and then they would get together as a collective and we, we're blessed to be able to get together as a collective and, and of course for instance I'll, I'll remind you of first Corinthians chapter 11 uh, people were abusing the Lord's Supper and eventually uh, clearly they were got together for the Lord's Supper Paul said hey don't you have homes in which to eat and to eat and drink. In other words, you left your homes, you came together for a gathering of the church to take the Lord's Supper and to worship, and you turned this in, into a debauched meal. And uh, so there was the big gatherings, with small gatherings, gatherings. All of us uh, uh, in, are, are involved in the church. So let me go uh, to the marching orders of the church now. We're going to find that in Matthew chapter 28. So, at the end of, of the Gospels, they all kind of end the same. Remember, four different Gospels, four different accounts of Jesus' life from four different perspectives. Just like maybe there was an accident at the robot. And uh, four different people give their accounts of what they saw. Well, somebody was standing uh, across the road. So when he looked, he said the background to, uh, to, to this accident was the Church of Christ. Somebody standing this side. No, the background to uh, the accident was the Nelson Mandela School of, of, of Medicine. So different perspectives, and, uh, but they all conclude Jesus is going to heaven. And he leaves marching orders for the church. And so I just want to read with you as, uh, as we see, because these are, are our marching orders. The marching orders that he gave to them are our marching orders orders as well. So let's read from verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Why not 12 disciples? Who's missing? Judas. Okay. They went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. I mean, Jesus was uh, the plan. God had a plan for the fullness of time. Um, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Folks, I cannot begin to tell you how important that is that worship is one of the fundamental uh, purposes of, of the church. I've been, I've been working through the, uh, the Old Testament again just in, in my quiet time. And it was very interesting that uh, they're the people in Egypt and Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And of course he doesn't. Uh, and there, there's all the plagues, you know, the gnats and the flies and, and uh, the frogs and the blood and the first one. But every time Moses doesn't say, let my people go so we can go to the promised land. It's never that. It's always, let my people go so we can worship. So we can worship. And then, uh, then Pharaoh said, okay, I'll tell you, just the men can go, you worship, you leave your, your, your wives here. Moses said, no. 
said, okay, you take your, your men and your women, your children, but leave your livestock. Yet. No, no, no. We need our livestock because we need a sacrifice to God, a sacrificial offering which they always made when they worshiped to God. So all the time, getting out of Egypt was be able to worship in freedom. We get to worship in freedom. And it's staggering that some people don't even choose to do that. They find something else to do on the first day of the week when, when, when the Lord's people get together. One of, the, one of the number one things as a church is we worship together. And I really encourage you, discipline your minds when we come here, that your minds are somewhere else. This, this is our hour that we worship to, together. So the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. There will always be doubters. There will always be doubters. I mean, these are the eleven. They've seen the resurrection. They saw the crucifixion. They saw the resurrection. They've spoken to Jesus after he died, but some doubted. We worship even when there's doubt around. Then Jesus came to them and said, and here it is. Here's the marching orders of Jesus. The final words of Jesus before he goes back to heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. You want to know what the function of the church is? Make disciples. Make disciples. This, the, the, this verse, Jesus never said go and make Christians. We have saw already the, the word Christian only appears three times in the Bible. And it's never used by Christians to refer to Christians. It's always referred to in a negative sense. Um, that's, that's another discussion. But go and make disciples. People that decide, this is my life. This is my life. Hey, I'm, I might be doing something else. I'm, I might be a nurse or an architect or accountant or, or you know, I might work in an office or I might be a taxi driver or whatever. But my number one function in life is I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. What we like to do is we like to invite people. Hey, we got a Valentine's Day service. We got a Mother's Day. Got a... Come, come, come. Jesus said, no. Go, go. Wherever we go, wherever you go, you make disciples and you baptize them. That's the way you make disciples. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's not, there's not a, such a thing as an unbaptized uh, Christian an unbaptized disciple in the scriptures. And then you teach them to obey everything I've, I've commanded you. Teach them, teach them, teach them. That's why Bible study is so important to us. And folks, I really want to encourage you. Stay for our Bible study. What better thing have you got to do for 30 minutes when we finish here today? We have a cup of tea, 30 minutes minutes. That's all it is. And get into, into the word at home. It just, it, it just shows, you know, we've re, I put in the bulletin, the faith comes by hearing. And if you're not hearing the word, how are you going to grow your faith? Come and stay for our Bible study. And uh, Matthew does a great job with it. Uh, and uh, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Oh, Jesus taught a lot of things. We know at the end of the, the book of John, Jesus, uh, John records that Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in this book, but these are recorded that you might believe. You might believe. You might believe. So as when we're hearing the stories of Jesus and what Jesus did and his teaching, his parables, and, and what he passed on to the apostles, we grow in, in our belief. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you. I want to I wanna, um, go with you to Acts chapter 2. So Jesus has gone back to heaven. And uh, we've got the Pentecost. This is the birth of the church. Jesus, I'm going to build my church. And this is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. So in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, I mean, Peter's preached this sermon. And uh, 3,000 people res responded. And so they baptized. Uh, just the most normal thing to do on a response of Jesus is to get baptized. And so verse 42, let's read from Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, because this is what the early church did, and this is what we need to be engaged in. They devoted themselves. Folks, this is what, not a hobby. This is not a suggestion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they wanted to know more. Uh, you have in a Bible study, we're there. 
You got an apostle come to share a prophecy? We there. We come to discuss the word of God. We are there. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship. People loved to be together with other people who were in this brand new organization uh, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now we are not sure whether this is talking about the Lord's Supper uh, or, or, or not, whether it's just a fellowship meal. Later on he talked in verse 46, they broke bread in their homes. Maybe one is the Lord's Supper and not the other one. We don't, we don't know. But certainly the Lord's Supper, participating in the Lord's Supper was, a, as Cody reminded us, remembering Jesus, focusing on, on, on the cross. Um, Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe. Let us never forget the awe of the cross, what Jesus did. Uh, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. The, by the way, folks, they never had a Bible there. They didn't have a New Testament and say, turn to 2 Corinthians, turn to John. That, that was to be written later on what they were doing. So many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. They sold property and possessions. Boy, these people were generous. They gave to anyone who had need. Incredibly generous. Uh, every day they continued to meet together. Remember they'd left their homes uh, wherever they are. They'd come together for this feast. And uh, they didn't go home immediately. They delayed their, their, uh, they delayed their return. People were running out of provisions. Everybody just came together. They uh, continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. Hey, man, so and so just come on over. Didn't know you before, but I met you in the temple courts when we were worshiping together. Come on over to our house. Let's continue to, to, uh, to, to fellowship. Uh, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart, praising God. One of the main functions of the church, worship, praising God, and enjoying the favor of all the people. The people were behaving in such a way that they had faith. People looked favorably on them. Not just the Christians, but the Jews, the people of Jerusalem. Wow, look at the way these new people believe because of their following Jesus. And the Lord added to their number daily, such as were being saved. The Lord added to the, the Lord gets to add to the church people when they're, when they're baptized into Jesus Christ, raised to walk in a new life. I want to close with one other uh, passive, one passive scripture. That's Ephesians chapter 4. Rory, if you'll go here, Ephesians chapter 4. I read it for you earlier that, that the man in, uh, verse, the, the, uh, another verse in Ephesians chapter 4, that God's wisdom is going to be made known through the church. Not any other way, but through the church. And um, then the, the writer, possibly the uh, Apostle Paul, he writes, So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists. So Jesus said, I'll build my church. And then he structured it. And the way he instructed his church was uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And verse 12 is what I want to focus on and leave you with this thought today. Their job, the job of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the people for the work of service. The, the job of, of discipling the world is not the job of the apostles, pastors, teachers. It's our job. It's everybody's job. Their job, our job as teachers is to equip you for the work of service. And when everybody understands that we are a priesthood of believers, every one of us is a minister, then our church will grow. But if we're leaving it for uh, you know, just, a, just a few people, everyone can get involved. I want to tell you a story. I think this is a remarkable story. Machil told it to me, and then I went and confirmed it with somebody this morning. I want to tell you the story. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave the people anonymous to, because I haven't spoken to them. A member of this congregation who's struggled with poor health went into a diskem outside of Durban, a waterfall area. And she went to, into diskem, she walked into, you know, where they dispense the medicines. And she, she spoke to an assistant pharmacist there. And he said to her, how are you doing? And she said, being truthfully honest, I'm not doing too good. And uh, they got involved. And eventually he said to her, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And they prayed there. 
in this game. That was great. Didn't know each other. She comes to church here a couple of weeks later, and guess who she sees? That assistant pharmacist who prayed for her. Both of them members of this congregation, they didn't even know each other. But people, someone stood up and was a disciple. Someone stood up and lived his faith and so I want to say to you this year, it doesn't matter whether you're an accountant or a doctor or a priest or, a, you know, you're, you're an engineer or, or you're a nurse or a taxi driver. Said it. it doesn't matter what you Would you consider being a disciple? I'm so proud of, of, of that young man who stood up and lived his faith. By the way, he's a graduate of Glen, Glenwood Christian School. Glenwood Christian School. I'm super proud of him because it's hard to do that. We live in such a pagan world where the pressures of hedonism around us push us away from Jesus. And he stands out like that. A beacon of light in our dark world. So will you come and join us tonight at 6 o'clock? I'd love to hear what's on your heart. The, the elders want to hear fr from, uh, from you. And said, listen, you know, what about if we do this? And remember, folks, what the scripture says. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I'm asking you today, this 19th day of January, at the beginning of year, will you put up your hand? Put up your hand. Count me in. We need Sunday school teachers. We need people in children's church. Uh, you know, we, we need people to do D and do. There's a, there's a myriad of things. And, and, and uh, of course, you all know by now that we have... We, we have Purchased a property, it's the name of the school of preaching, but we're a new venture uh, up in the waterfall area. Super excited. The possibilities are endless. And that's why we need your vision. Because if it's just a few of the leadership, men, you know what the Bible says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. I might have an idea, Les might have an idea, but when we get together and we stir each other up to love and good works. So would you, would you think about it? Let's stand together as, uh, as we sing.